he describes himself through different names, and, and each one of these names reveals something different about the way that he deals with us. So in Genesis chapter 17, verses 1 and 2, we'll have a look. It says, And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect, and I will make covenant. Oh, sorry, and I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shalt thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. So in verse number one, we see that the Lord reveals himself as the almighty God. He says, I am the almighty God. Now the Hebrew word for this is the word El Shaddai. El Shaddai. Um, El means the strong one. The one who is almighty. And Shaddai, is, um, apparently, I, I'm not a Hebrew expert, so I, I'm depending here upon a commentary. Um, but when you look at the, the basis of the word Shaddai, it comes from the Hebrew word Shad, which, uh, which uh, it, it means a, a lady's breast, that in the sense that a child draws its nourishment from. And uh, if you've ever watched a child feeding, uh, particularly a hungry child like Conrad would, uh, Conrad's a voracious eater. He, um, you know, he, he, I don't think Conrad has ever stopped. I mean, we've stopped for him. We, uh, you know, we say, no, no, that's enough. He just keeps going and going. Um, but no, but what the implication here, El Shaddai means that God is all sufficient to supply our needs. And you see, the, the context of this Genesis chapter 17 is significant because how old is Abraham here? Have a look in the passage, Genesis 17. When Abram was 90 years old and nine, that's pretty old. Oh, that's older than Jeff. That's saying something. No, but he's, he's something. an old man. He's very old, in fact. And God, 24 years ago, when uh, when God appeared to Abram in Ur of the Chaldees and said, get out of your house, get out of your father's house, I'll make a nation of you. He's there and he doesn't have any kids. And God said, through Sarah, there will come the promised seed. God will uh, provide the seed and you will be the father of a great nation. And later on, God said, you'll be the father of many nations. Um, but he said to a 99-year-old man, okay, the plan's coming into fruition now. Um, you're going to have a kid now. And, and Abram, uh, who became Abraham in this chapter, and we saw that, he heard the name that God is all sufficient. God is the one who can supply his needs. And, uh, and so this promise would shortly be fulfilled to Abram, uh, now Abraham, and Sarah would have a child, and that child was Isaac, and God would work his purposes through Isaac, and not only work his purposes, but also God said to Abram, I'm going to change your name from Abram, which means my father, and I'm going to make your name Abraham, which means the father of many nations. You're not only going to have one child, and he's going to be a great people, but you're also going to have a lot of children, and you're going to have a lot of kids. And they're going to have a lot of kids, and, and you know what, you're going to be the father of not just one nation, but many nations. And to a 99-year-old man who's as good as dead, the Bible says that he was as good as dead and Sarah's womb was as good as dead too uh, in the book of Hebrews, he heard the promise of God and he took God at his word because God said, I am sufficient to meet your needs. Now, I don't know what lessons we can draw from that. I think I do. God is all sufficient for our needs too. You see, God is El Shaddai. God as the one who is all sufficient, the almighty God is all sufficient to meet our needs and we need to learn to trust him and his supply for our lives so that's the first one we see tonight the second one we'll see again these aren't in any particular order not even in chronological scripture order they're just in the way we we did it but the second one is this el elion so let's go um, genesis chapter 14 if you will genesis 14 now i appreciate that this is a bit of a different sort of a message probably more of a a bible study than a uh, than a sermon but i think it's good to have a bit of bible study sometimes so Genesis 14, verse 18. Let's have a look. Now, what's happened in this chapter is that, uh, that Lot, Abram's nephew, has been carried away captive by the, uh, by the armies of a, a combined coalition of nations. And we see in chapter 14, they're listed there. And they, it says that they've come across from near Babylon. And now they've taken Lot and all of Sodom and Gomorrah captive. And they're all marching away. And Abram grabs his servants. And I think there's, what, 318 of them. And they pursue them, they slaughter them all, and it's all good. Now they're bringing back all Lot 
Lot and his family and all the people from Sodom and Gomorrah and all these people are coming back and Abram's met by two people. He's met by the first one who is the king of Sodom and uh, the king of Sodom comes out and says, oh, Abram, thank you, thank you. You can keep all the stuff. Uh, we'll just take our people. And Abram says, no, no, you keep all your stuff. I don't want you to say that you made Abram rich uh, because it's God that does this. But then another man met him in verse number 18. And I reckon he's one of the most interesting characters in the scripture. I, I don't know, maybe you don't, but I think he's a very interesting character. And his name is Melchizedek. And uh, it says, And Melchizedek, king of Salem, uh, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Bless, uh, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he gave him tithes of all. Now, El Elyon, that, that phrase there where it says, Melchizedek was the priest of the Most High God. Now, this is the name of God that shows his exalted nature over all his creation. You see, Melchizedek was a Gentile priest who ministered to a Gentile nation. He is called Melchizedek, which means the king of righteousness. And then uh, he's the king of a city named Salem, which means the king of peace. And uh, in the book of Hebrews, more of this is brought out later, so we won't look too much into Melchizedek tonight. Um, but this name of God, as I said, shows his exalted over creation and his particular, uh, it, it doesn't have particular context to the Jews, but to the entire world, that the Lord is the most high one. He is the one who is over all. It's used in the Psalms of God. Uh, mostly the Messianic Psalms speaking about the sun returning and ruling over the earth. Uh, it's used in the book of Daniel when the, the Gentile king of Jews, because Daniel is primarily written about the Gentile nation, says that he is the most high and he is the one who will rule the world as the most high God. And El Elion means that God is most high and he should be our number one priority in our life. Um, there are many things that strive for our attention and our affection, but God is the one who should be our focus. He should be the supreme being. And by saying that he is El Elyon, it means that he is number one in our lives. So God, the most high God, should be the most high God in our lives, not just by title, but by actual fact as well. So God is the most high. So firstly, he is El Shaddai. Secondly, he is El Elyon. Secondly, secondly, again, secondly to second. Thirdly, um, the, the third name we'll see tonight is the name Adonai. Adonai. Let's go to Genesis chapter 15. And most of these verses that I'm giving you are the first occurrence of the, the name given there. Um, but my, a lot of these are used many times. Um, the Adonai, for example, this one we're going to see now, is it, used over 430 times. Uh, we may not see it tonight, but Jehovah or Yahweh is used over 6,500 times in the Old Testament, the name of the Lord. So uh, we're not going to look at the recurrence, by the way, so you're sitting there going, well, I'm not coming next week. Uh, no, we're not going to look at all of them. But let's see Adonai. Uh, in verse number 1 and 2 of Genesis chapter 15, it says this, After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield, and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eleazar of Damascus? Now, the story is, this is actually just after uh, what we saw with Abram and the Most High God. Um, and the kings have been defeated, but there would be a tendency for Abraham now to be afraid. I, I think, you know, like, well, I've just picked a fight with five kings, I'm one man, what's going to happen? Well, God comes and says, Abraham, fear not, I am thy shield, uh, and thy exceeding great reward. But he said, uh, Abraham then says to the Lord, Lord God, now that word Lord, but it's L, small o-r-d, is the word Adonai in Hebrew. And Adonai means master, master or Lord, and not in the sense Lord, as we think Lord God Almighty, but Lord as in someone whose stature is above yours, who's positionally higher, than you. Uh, and so this one is used over three, uh, 430 times in the Old Testament, and the Greek equivalent is the word kurios, which, for those of you who care, uh, it's, it's Lord, it's Master, it's, it's one of those terms that's used of someone who outranks someone. And what it shows God as is our Master, and He is the one to whom we owe allegiance. Uh, where El Elion shows His position above us, 
Master shows his rank in our life and how he should be the one who gives the orders. And we're going to see more of these. You might say a lot of these link in very well with each other, and they do. A lot of them are quite similar. But Adonai, uh, when we say that God is our Adonai, we say that he is our master. Jesus said in the book of Luke chapter 6, when speaking to people, he said, And why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? So the lesson we can learn is that the Lord is our master, and as such, we should seek to do his will. Uh, because he is the one who is our boss. He is the one who is in charge here. And he has, uh, we, we speak about in the army, because I do army stuff, as you're probably aware. Um, I'm doing some study in command and leadership at the moment. Now, do you know what the difference between command and leadership is? I'll give it to you. Now, command is the legal authority. Command is the legal authority that I, as an officer of the Queen, have. So, uh, the, the, the military has commissioned me, or the, the Governor General, the representative of the Queen, uh, has commissioned me as an officer uh, within Her Majesty's Australian Army, and I have the legal authority to, to tell people what to do who are below my rank. Um, they don't particularly have too much of a right of appeal. They, they can, and, you know, if I say to do something stupid, they, uh, you know, they, uh, they, they probably shouldn't do it, but I have the legal authority, and that's what Adonai is. It's the legal authority as a commander that God has. Now, leadership is a different kettle of fish. It's not uh, as... As leaders, you don't want to depend upon your, uh, I guess, the command side of the relationship to, you know, if you're always saying, I'm the boss, follow me, chances are you're not the boss. <laughs> uh, you just think you are. Uh, but no, Adonai, God, that is his legal right as our master and our Lord. And the Lord is our master, and as such, we should seek to do his will. So number four, let's keep going then. Um, the, third, the fourth, I keep getting it wrong, the fourth one, I've got it written in Roman numerals, that's my problem. Uh, the fourth one is El Olam. El Olam. And, and let's keep going then. Look, if you can't remember them or you're not taking notes, that's all right. But I'll give you what it means in English, and that way it's going to be easier for you to, uh, to bear in mind. But Genesis 21, verse number 33. Genesis chapter 21, and verse number 33. Genesis 21, 33. And it says, And Abraham planted a grove in Beersheba, and called there on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. And called there on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. So El Olem is the everlasting God. And what this name of God shows us is his eternality. It shows that God is eternal. And we don't think of eternal, as God is eternal to us. We, we can't truly comprehend that. You know, I can think of old. I can think of ancient. I can think in terms of millions of years, billions of years, trillions of years, but I can't think of eternity. You know, when it, 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 and there's a very interesting Hebrew word uh, in Micah chapter 5. Uh, actually, you know, Micah chapter 5 verse 2, when it's speaking about Christ here, uh, because, I don't know, it, it, it helps me to understand it, I guess, a bit. But in Micah chapter 5, where are we? Micah chapter 5 verse 2. There. It says this, but thou, and this is a famous verse, but thou, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. Now, when you look at that, it's a prophecy of Christ coming out of Bethlehem, um, and, and I like it says, out of thee, that's out of Bethlehem shall he, that's Jesus Christ, come forth unto me, that's the Father, that is to be ruler in Israel. But look at the description, it says, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. Now, there's two Hebrew words that are used there. The word, the, the Hebrew word for old, I don't actually have the word written here, but it's meaning it's a vanishing point. It's like you look on the horizon and it keeps going far, far beyond what you can see. And uh, in everlasting, it means eternity. So it means... Think as far ahead as you can go to the point where you can't think about it anymore and God is still there. And God just keeps going and going. Think back to a time beyond the time that you can even imagine. Think about it and God is still there. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> there goes my mind. But, uh, but no. Uh, Olem, uh, sorry, El Olem, the everlasting God, shows us the eternality of God and his reign and rule over the things of eternity. You see, one of the great fears of mankind is change. 
changed? Who do you like to change? I mean, okay, you come to work. Uh, let's say you go to work tomorrow and your boss says, we're making some changes around here. Who sits there and goes, yippee. Uh, we're making some changes around here. You might be thinking, well, I hope I'll be here. You know, maybe you hope I won't be. Uh, no, but things are going to change around here. Things are going to be different. Um, you know, we look back 30 years ago and say things aren't the same as they used to be. Perhaps you look in the mirror and you think, oh, things aren't the same as they used to be. Uh, that, that's change. Change comes and change happens. It's one of the great fears of mankind. The good illustration of this is seen in politics. Uh, one politician promises something and then another politician gets in and what happens? I'm sorry, things have changed. Sometimes the one politician is in and then things just change anyway. It doesn't even... The politician doesn't change, just the promise doesn't matter anymore. But, but uh, God is not like that. God is unchanging. The Lord is eternal. He is the unchanging one. Uh, in Deuteronomy 33, 27, Moses, speaking to the people, he said, The eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. And what he said to them is this, The things of earth you put your confidence in are going to pass away. They will. That, that's going to happen. The things that we trust in, uh, when you're a kid, you put your trust in your parents. Uh, as you start getting older, you put your trust in your job. You put your trust in maybe your abilities. Maybe you put your trust in your good looks or whatever it is. Those things will pass away. Uh, but Moses says to the people that the everlasting God, the eternal God is thy refuge. And underneath are the everlasting arms. You see, as Christians, we are bound not by the arms of mortality, although one day we will die, but underneath we have the everlasting arms of God supporting us. That's why the hymn writer wrote, uh, what a fellowship, what a joy is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. You see, it's our arms of eternal power that hold us up. Uh, Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, Now unto the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, the honour and glory forever and ever. Amen. Jesus Christ the same, yesterday, today and forever. Amen. Moses wrote in the Psalms, Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, for ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. You see, El Olem, the everlasting God, shows us that God is eternal. And, uh, and we can depend upon his character, we can depend upon his unchanging nature, for he is the everlasting, eternal God. And what God was yesterday is what he will be in a million years what he was before the world began is what he will be in eternity future. And we can put our trust in that. See, people change, but God does not. Yesterday, today, forever, Jesus is the same. And uh, we can put our confidence in that. And you see, when Jesus says to the disciples, or, or he's saying this prayer, and he says, Father, keep them through your name, this is, who, this is who is holding us. It's not us. It is him. It is his name that holds us. It is his character. So let's keep cracking on. Number four was LLM. Uh, sorry, El Olam. The, the fifth one is this, and this is the word Elohim. Now, this is uh, the second most used reference of God. Does anyone know where the first time this occurs in the Bible is? First time. Sorry? In the beginning of God. Yeah. It's the very first indication of God. Let's go to Genesis 1, verse 1. A pretty famous verse. It's a verse a lot of people start with, and uh, then they stop about three chapters later. <laughs> no, but Genesis 1, verse 1. In the beginning... God created the heaven and the earth. Now, this word is used over 2,000 times in the Old Testament to refer to God. Um, it refers to God as the judge, as the creator, and as God himself. Um, it would seem to be a reference to his creative power and genius, and hence his right to be the ruler over all the universe as its king. Um, there's an interesting verse, actually, I was reading just the other day in Isaiah 33, verse 22. It says that the Lord is our... Actually, let's go there. Go there. I've got it written here, but I want you to see it, because I think it's a great... Um, it's a great passage. It speaks about human government. Um, and some have said that the American founding fathers uh, got their ideas of government from this passage. I'm not sure if they did or they didn't, but it's a good verse. Uh, it says this in uh, Isaiah 33, verse 22. It says, For the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. He will save us. And, uh, and when Isaiah is writing this out, it outlines the three forms of the US government, uh, the, the judicial in the, the courts, which are the judge, 
the legislative, which is the law giving, and the executive, which is the president or the king. Um, and yeah, some have said, oh, that's where they got it from, and maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But you see that the Lord, and, and there that's speaking about God as Jehovah, and, and we'll cover up on that another time, um, but the Lord is all those things to us. He is the one who gives the law. And because we are made by Him, because we are created by Him, because He is the one that spoke the word in the beginning and created the heaven and the earth, and also He made us, what does that mean? He has the right to tell us what to do. He has the right of veto. If you've ever talked to someone, they say, what right does God have to tell me what to do? Well, He is Adonai. He is the one that knit you together. He is the one that formed all things. And therefore... He is God. He is the one who is above us. Uh, Adonai, oh sorry, Elohim, sorry, we're at Elohim now, uh, means that God has the right to rule over the universe as its king. See, God is the one who made us. He is the one who gives our laws and he is the one who will judge us. Therefore, we should have respect for him as God and live, to, live our lives in accordance with the framework that he has laid out. And I, I just think that's pretty logical that uh, not everyone gets that. But anyway, that's all good. So, so God, uh, and we saw that one, sorry, I'll put that one there so I get that. Elohim, Elohim, God is the judge, the creator, and he is God. Now the next one we'll see is an interesting one, and uh, it's the word <coughs> Kana. Now I don't know, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. I don't have the, have you ever noticed uh, a lot of the Middle Eastern languages, uh, they, they sound a little bit like you've got something in your throat. Kana. So I'm probably uh, doing that wrong, so my apologies to the Persian folks here, but it's probably... So, but let's go, Exodus chapter 34. Exodus 34, verse number 14. Are you doing well? Yeah, I was alright with that. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm practicing my fasting as well. It'd be hard, you know, you go down to like him, you're like, oh, it's not bad, but it's a promise, it's a sabuni. Yeah. I like all those things, by the way, so it's good. Okay, come up. I'm going to say Kana, that's pronounced it wrong. It's Q-A-N-N-A, -N -N -A, so you can pronounce it how you like. Uh, that, that's the, uh, the transliteration of the Hebrew word. Uh, so Exodus 34, verse number 14, it says this, For thou shalt worship no other god, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous god. For the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous god. Now that word jealous there, is the word kana or kana. And, uh, and, and what it means is that God is jealous. And, uh, and the word is an aspect of God's character that is likened to a husband or, or a spouse. And uh, if your spouse went off with someone else, what would be your response? Jealousy. Rightful jealousy. But hey, 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 what's going on? For better, for worse. I know that I'm probably more of the for worse, but you're stuck with me. You know? And uh, hey, I'm jealous. I, and if that happened to me, I would not be a very happy person. Jealousy is not sinful. Envy is. Envy is where you look at what God has given someone else and say, hey, uh, I wish I had what he had. Covetousness is where you look at someone else's wife or whatever or their husband and go, hey, I don't have what they have. That's coveting, envy. But jealousy is a good thing. Jealousy is when you rightfully own something. And when God says he is jealous, it means that we should not split our affection between him and anything else. He alone is worthy of our praise and our love. Now this word occurs in the context of God being jealous six times, and it's all within the context of God and Israel. Um, it's all in the book of Exodus and Deuteronomy. Uh, I can give you the references later if you want. But the lesson we learn by God being jealous is that God is a jealous God, and there is nothing in our life that should take his place. So you might say, well, we've already seen that for other things. But this is the actual part of God. And, and there's a, a verse, I think it's in Deuteronomy 6, 15 perhaps, where it says that God is a consuming fire. There's that jealousy burning away. And when we put something else on the throne of our hearts, on the throne of our lives, it makes God jealous. It's just what it says. And, uh, and so we need to be careful. And, uh, and we ought to be jealous of our own character as well to make sure that we, uh, we are doing things right for God. So God doesn't want our affection split between him or anything else. And uh, in the context of the Israelites, he was speaking about idolatry, but uh, I think that we can also have idolatry in many, many different areas of our own lives too. So let's, uh, let's continue on. Now, the, the, uh, the seventh one we'll see is the name Jehovah, Yahweh, or, uh, yeah, we'll say Yahweh, because 
it's, it's, it's sort of unpronounceable the way it's actually written. It's YHWH, but they've made it Yahweh to make it easy to uh, pronounce. Now, it's used, this name for God is used. The name Jehovah, or if you see L-O-R-D, all in capitals, that's this word. It's used six, over 6,500 times in the Old Testament. That's why it's called the Holy Bible. It's about God. It has his name in it. And, uh, and this word is used, and Schofield actually puts a good note about it, saying that it means the self-existent one, uh, the self-existent one. It answers the question, who made God? Who made God? The answer is no one. No one made God, because he self-exists. He is the first cause. He is the one that has no cause. He is the one that started this whole thing rolling. And the Bible doesn't actually make an argument or an explanation for God. It merely starts out with a declaration that says, in the beginning, God. It doesn't say, Back yonder, there was a force and it came together. No, it just says, God was there and he made it. There it is. Bang. Done. And this, uh, this, this part, or this name of God, Jehovah, means that God is the self-existing one. The one who no one made, but who made everything. And, uh, and when there, there are many names that the Lord, uh, I, I don't like to use the word tax on, uh, but the, the name Jehovah is used many times in the scriptures, and the Lord uses um, additional descriptors on that name. So what we'll do now, we've got a, a little bit of time, we'll have a look through the Jehovah, I call them the Jehovah plus names, because God says, I am Jehovah something. And, and I'll show you what I mean in a moment. So let's see the first one. The first one is Jehovah Sabaoth. Jehovah Sabaoth. Now this means the Lord of Armies. What it means is he stands as the commander-in-chief of the armies of heaven. It's first used in the book of 1 Samuel, when they're praying and the, the Lord of hosts is there. It's used, um, this phrase, the Lord of hosts, or God of hosts, is used over 280 times in the scriptures. It's a big part of the scriptures. When you read the Psalms, oftentimes, particularly the, uh, the ones where they're saying, Lord, smite them. Lord of hosts, God of armies, destroy our enemies who are seeking to destroy us. And uh, it's... And the people in those days depended upon God to fight their battles. And it's comforting to us to know that God is able to sort out situations. Uh, the Bible teaches that vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, and I will repay. And when we are confronted with a situation that is beyond us, we would do well to remember that the Lord is the Lord of hosts. He is the God of armies. He is the one who is in charge. He is not uh, powerless. You know, I'm glad we don't have a powerless God. He is able to do stuff. So the second one we'll see tonight is the Lord, our righteousness. Um, it's used two times in the Bible, in the book of Jeremiah. Uh, actually, go to Jeremiah if you would. Jeremiah chapter 23 and Jeremiah chapter... Actually, we'll go to Jeremiah 33 first, and then Jeremiah 23 after that. And uh, Jeremiah, if you know or if you're familiar with the book, Jeremiah was written just prior to the captivity. And, uh, and Jeremiah was actually um, in Jerusalem the last time it fell to the Babylonians uh, in 586 BC. So a lot of the book of Jeremiah is Jeremiah saying, repent, 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 otherwise it's all going to be destroyed. And then his message changes to, all right, it's too late, it's all going to be destroyed, this is what's going to happen afterwards. <laughs> um, it's sort of like, okay, I give up, you guys are going to all die, you know, the, the city's going to be captured, and this is what God's going to do. And... Uh, when we look in Jeremiah chapter 33, he looks beyond the captivity, he looks beyond even the coming again, and he looks to a future time when the Lord himself will rule over Israel. So in Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 14 and 15, it says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will perform that good thing which I have promised unto the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. In those days and at that time will I cause the branch of righteousness to grow up unto David, and he shall execute judgment and righteousness in the land. In those days shall Judah be saved, and Jerusalem shall dwell safely. And this is the name wherewith she shall be called, the Lord our righteousness. And that, again, is speaking about a future time. It's not a time that has come, it's a time that will come in the future when Israel will dwell safely in their land. And if you read through the Bible, particularly the book of Romans, you see that God is not finished with Israel. God will restore them as a nation, and, and it's pointed out in many parts, but in Ezekiel particularly, he'll bring them together in unbelief as we see now, and then he will restore them spiritually uh, later on. But he's speaking there about the time that will come when, they, uh, when the man, the branch of righteousness, shall be called the Lord our righteousness. And that's spoken again about in uh, Jeremiah 
20 threes, so I thought I saw a cockroach, <laughs> but it wasn't. Uh, but in Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 5 and 6, he speaks about how the city of Jerusalem will also be called the place where the Lord of Righteousness lives. And, uh, and look, so as Christians, I don't think this is a hard one to draw an application from because, you see, the Lord is our righteousness. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, uh, it says, For he hath made him, that's Christ, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So the Lord is our righteousness. It is his finished work on the cross that makes us right with God and it allows a sinful man to be put in a relationship with God. And, uh, and so that is the Lord, our righteousness, or I'm not even going to try and pronounce the Hebrew words now, but it's like Sid Kenu. Sid Kenu. I, 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 I looked at that and I'm like, uh, I don't know, I, I think Kanu was bad enough, but Sid Kenu. Uh, so the first one was Jehovah Sabaoth, the second one is Jehovah Sid Kenu, the Lord, our righteousness. The third one is this, the, the third Jehovah plus name is Jehovah Jireh. Does anyone know where Jehovah Jireh is found? It's one time in the Bible. Genesis, uh, Genesis, 20, Genesis 22. Yeah, very good. Uh, you picked the Bible College graduate. The guy, and he, he's on the camera. We should turn the camera around. And did you know, like, um, did you ever see those TV shows where they zoom around and they look at the audience? They always go to the people who look really interested. Like, they never go to the person sleeping over that side. They always go to the person who's like, you know, like, you know, then like watching the, uh, I'll confess my faults here, the, the Wiggles. And, uh, you know, they sometimes zoom around and they look at the kids and there's always one kid that's just way over the top, you know, and one mum who's just really getting into it. And, uh, you know, you can sort of see in the background, there's the mums who are just there going, I just want to go and get a coffee. That's all I want. And then there's the one mum who's already had the triple caffeine hit and she's dancing, you know, and, and uh, anyway. We should get that and zoom in on Michael because I don't think he gets enough attention on Facebook. So you know, maybe we'll do that uh, next week. I'll have a camera and be like looking back at you. But uh, no, but Jehovah Jireh, and speaking about that, it's actually a very good segue. What does Jehovah Jireh mean? So I don't know. What Jehovah Jireh actually means is the Lord sees. The Lord sees. Jireh comes from a Hebrew word that means to see. And uh, let's go to Genesis chapter 22. Because I thought that too, you know. I, I know the song Jehovah Jireh, my provider. You know, it's, it's great. You know, we used to sing it at youth group and we used to slam the chairs and you know, you know, it was good times. Uh, but but uh, what it actually means, and, and we'll have a look there in Genesis chapter twenty-two, verse fourteen. It's the one time it said, um, and, and the context is that Abraham has brought Isaac, and uh, he's going to offer him up. He's brought him. And uh, they've gone with all the young men and all the stuff, and they go for a journey. And then Abraham says to the other young men, you guys wait here, and me and the lad will go on yonder and worship. And, uh, and then we'll come back again. Uh, you know, there's that sort of understanding that God's going to do something. And Abraham, the Bible teaches us, actually thought that he was going to kill Isaac, and then God was going to raise him up. Uh, that's what it says in Hebrews. Uh, but he says, look, I, we will go yonder, and we will come back again. And as they get to the place, you know the story, he builds the altar, puts Isaac on it, and just as he's got his knife ready to kill, you know, in obedience to God, God says, Abram, Abram, stop. Stop there. Uh, stop Abraham, sorry. Um, you, you don't need to do that. Uh, now that I know, and he says in verse 12, but now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld my son, thine only son, from me. Uh, I can just imagine the, uh, the pressure. Abraham would be going, you know, the heart going, he's like, oh, thanks, Lord. Um, and Abram lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abram went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abram called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, for it is said to this day, In the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. And so what it means is that God sees. God sees. And that implies that God sees our needs and meets them. God, so it is. There is an aspect of providing there, but that God sees us in our hour of need. Uh, there's another story in the life of Abraham, before he became Abraham, actually, uh, Abraham uh, when there was Hagar. And the story of Hagar, if you're not familiar, Hagar went and she had been taken as a slave out of Egypt by Abraham's household. And, uh, and then Sarah goes, well, look, I'm old and I want a kid. And God said we'd have a kid. Let's turn the phones off, shall we? <laughs> All right. Um, so, so Hagar's there. See, I reckon Abraham had a puppy. They didn't have robot phones in those days. <laughs> uh, but there Hagar is. 
So I'm, I'm going to make life tr tricky for Michael. I'll go this way. Then Hagar was, and uh, and they go, Abraham, you're going to have a kid with Hagar. Everyone's like, oh, yeah, all right, whatever. You know, those days were different than these days, I reckon. Um, but Sarah says, Abraham, you're going to go and uh, do the deed with Hagar. We're going to have a kid that way. And that's how God's going to supply it. Anyway, we know the story. Hagar gets pregnant, and Sarah gets annoyed because Hagar's like, well, I'm having a baby and you're not, pretty much. And, and the Bible says that Hagar despised her mistress. And Sarah says, we can't have this happening. Abraham, send her out. Abraham's like, oh, okay, whatever. So out goes Hagar. And Hagar's in the middle of the desert. Um, and they sent her out with just a bottle of water and I think a, a loaf of bread from memory. I, I you know, had to put the passage. Um, but there she is. And she puts down Ishmael. And Ishmael's there, sorry, she's had the baby. So she puts him down. She puts him down and says, I don't want to see him die. I don't want to see him die. And, uh, and so she puts him down and leaves him, uh, and then she's praying, and the, uh, and the Lord, an angel, comes and says, what's going on? And, uh, and he points out a well, and she calls the well, Beer Laharoi, which means the well of him that lives and sees me. And, uh, and what she says is that the Lord saw me in my hour of need, and he supplied my need. And, uh, and that's Jehovah Jireh. He is the one that sees and cares for his people. You see, God sees us in our hour of need. He saw Abraham who offered his son to God. He saw Hagar in her hour of need. So he also sees us and cares for us to meet our needs too. You see, when we have a need, we should bring it to the Lord and say, Lord, I have a need. because Not because he hasn't seen it, but because he wants to hear us pray. And the Lord says that, uh, that you know, he'll meet our needs. David said in the Psalms, I have been young and now I'm old. You know, I've not seen the righteous forsaken or received begging for bread. And, uh, and that's the truth. So the Lord sees Jehovah Jireh. The fourth Jehovah plus name that we see is the Lord, our banner. Now, Exodus chapter 17 is the one time this uh, name occurs. Well, let's have a look. And, and this one sort of links in pretty nicely with uh, Jehovah Sabaoth or Jehovah, the Lord of hosts. But in Exodus chapter 17 and verse number 15, it says, uh, And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nissi, which means the Lord our banner, or the Lord our flag, the Lord our military ensign. Um, and what had happened is the people of Israel were fighting the people of Amalek. And uh, this whole passage is symbolic of intercessory prayer. So Moses was sitting on the hill, and um, I don't understand why this is. It's all, you know, have you ever thought about what it would be like to be the Jews? Because you've been wondering why stuff happens. You know, you don't realise that everything going on is a picture uh, of, of something later on. So people in uh, 2015 could be reading back and going, oh, that's a really good picture of that. You're just sitting there going, this is strange. You know, when Moses has his hands up, we win. When he has his hands down, we lose. Then he puts his hands up again and we win. Man, if I was Moses, I'd be... <laughs> you know, watch the armies go backwards and forwards. Uh, but no, the story was that the Lord said, you know, have your hands up. And when Moses stood on the hill with his hands in the air with the rod... Uh, the Israelites won. When his hands got heavy and they started, you know, he's an old man now, and his hands start falling down, the Israelites started losing. So Aaron and Hur come up alongside and sit down, and they hold his hands up for him, and uh, the Israelites win the day, and it's a picture of intercessory prayer, and how we should hold up our hands to God, as, as a, not necessarily literally, uh, but how we should hold up, yeah, holy hands, no, hold up our hands to God in prayer for others so that they can gain the victory. Uh, but after the battle, after the Amalekites had defeated them, Moses built a, an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nissi. And the truth is that the Lord is our resource. He is the one from whom we draw sustenance. He is the one that gives the victory. Uh, we saw in John chapter 15 verse 5 that he is the vine from whom we draw our resources from. And, uh, and we should come to him and abide in him because he is our victory or our banner. So let's see number five. The fifth Jehovah Plus. Oh, I don't want to keep this too long, but we'll keep going. We, 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 uh, that's all right. The, the fifth one is the Lord is my shepherd. Now, this is the word Jehovah Ra. Now, anyone know where this one is? Psalm 23. Good guess. Very lucky guess. That the Lord is my shepherd. We won't spend a great deal of time on this because it's a, a story in and of itself. But the imagery of the shepherd is one that the Lord uses because they understood that. A shepherd was one who came alongside and cared for his sheep individually. And to say that the Lord is our shepherd is to say that he cares for us. So number six is the Lord that heals us. Uh, Exodus chapter 15, verse 26, he said, And he said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight, 
and will give ear to his command and keep all his statutes. I will put none of these diseases upon thee which I brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. See, many of the diseases the Egyptians had were no doubt spiritually caused and also a result of rejecting God's way of living. Now, the, uh, the Bible teaches when we live God's way, we avoid many, many problems that many people encounter in the world. But more than that, the Lord heals us. Uh, not always physically. You know, the Bible doesn't teach that everyone will go through life in perfect health. Can we, can we just put that aside for a moment? Uh, the Bible says we can pray for healing. But there's nothing wrong there. Uh, we, we can ask the Lord uh, and say, Lord, I've got a problem. We can beseech the Lord. Uh, but it doesn't mean the Lord needs to heal. But what it does mean is that the Lord spiritually heals us. He takes our broken relationship and our sickness, spiritually speaking, and makes us spiritually healthy and brings us into a healthy relationship with Him. And uh, so look, with this, three more which we'll see very quickly. And the seventh Jehovah plus is Jehovah Shammah, which means the Lord is there. Now it's not actually a name of the Lord, but rather a name of a city where the Lord lives, and it's in Ezekiel chapter 48, verse 35. And uh, has anyone here read Ezekiel 40 through 48? Does anyone find a struggle, a struggle when you reach Ezekiel 40 and you're like, okay, this is a part of my Bible reading for the next four days. I'm gonna, I know there's probably architects who, you know, draw out the temple. And, and it's, it's, it's not a bad exercise to, to, if you do a Google search, people have done pictures of what, what is drawn. I find that easier than reading, and the dimensions of the temple were 125, you know, 60, but, and I'm like, oh, Lord, I'm not gonna build the thing, you know, let the other people read it, let the new, the new temple builders read it. But what, what is said of the Lord in that day is that the Lord is there. And we saw last week, those of us who have been born into Christ, those who are born again, are in Christ. And our name could then be said, the Lord is there too. You see, because we have the Holy Spirit indwelling us. So Jehovah Shammah is a name given to the Holy City uh, in the millennial reign of Christ. But it's also a name that could be given to Christians, Jehovah Shammah, because the Lord lives in us. The Lord is in there. And, uh, and that's... The Lord is there, Jehovah Shammah. Number eight is the Lord who sanctifies you. Now, this one is even worse than Sitkanu. It's Mekod Dishkenu. Mekod, Michael, can you help me here? Mekod Dishkenu. Yeah, there you go. Mekod <laughs> Dishkenu. Quite Michael. <laughs> Look, and it says in Exodus chapter 31, verse 13, Speak now also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily, my Sabbath shall you keep for it as a sign between me and you throughout all your generations that ye may know that I am the Lord that does sanctify you. And that means that the Lord who sanctifies us. You see, the word sanctify means to set us apart, means to make us holy. And the Lord has saved us that we might be different. Uh, Peter wrote, Ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people. And you show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. So the Lord saved us to change us and to make us different. And the last one we'll see tonight is the Lord, our peace. Does anyone know what this one is? Jehovah Shalom. Shalom. There we go. Everyone's on top of this one. Everyone's still paying attention, which is good. Jehovah Shalom. And uh, it's used in Judges, chapter 6, verse 24. Actually, this is a, this is a good one. So we walk down next. This is the last one we're going to see. So Judges, chapter 6. Judges, chapter 6. And this is in the life of Gideon. Now, what's interesting about this in uh, Judges chapter 6, verse 24, it says, Then Gideon built an altar there unto the Lord, called it Jehovah Shalom. Unto this day it is yet in Ophrah of the Abiezerites. Now, Jehovah Shalom means the Lord our peace, or peace with God, and the Lord is that peace. And uh, But when Gideon wrote this, that, who was Gideon? Just, just a very quick overview of who was Gideon. He was a judge. What did Gideon do? There was a group of people. The Midianites, so the Midianites had a mighty army, 128,000 from memory, soldiers in the land. The Israelites were pressed down and oppressed and, and they were in a pretty bad place. Gideon's hiding and he's, you know, he's threshing wheat, doing all these things. And the Lord appears to him and says, you're going to deliver Israel. And he asks for all these signs. But what happens after he does this, after he's first seen the Lord and he's realised that he knows the Lord, but he's seen the Lord face to face, he sets up an altar and calls it Jehovah Shalom. Now, what is the problem for Gideon that he has at the moment? The Midianites aren't beaten yet. He's still got 128,000 
hateful enemies of the Lord who are still roaming around, and yet he can sit there and go, the Lord is my peace. I have peace with God. And, uh, and that is the story of the Christian life. You see, God gave Gideon peace with God, even though he didn't have peace in the world around him yet. And so our circumstances are not, oh, sorry, our peace is not dependent on our outward circumstances, but rather on the presence of God within. And, uh, and so the Lord our peace, Jehovah Shalom, teaches us that when we have peace with God through Christ, we may still have outward circumstances that aren't the best. And to be honest, I think that will happen to all of us until we die. You know, we're always going to have some bad things happening. It's just going to happen. But with Christ in, we can have Jehovah Shalom, the Lord our peace, peace with God, rather than the peace of our world around us, but we have peace with God. So, look, let's go over quickly what we've seen. I, I am aware that I've given a lot tonight, and I, uh, I, I don't normally like to do lists and all those things. But let's see, so Jesus, when praying to the Father, he said that the Father would keep them through his name. What was his name? Well, his name, we saw, is El Shaddai. He's the Almighty God who is able to supply our needs. He is El Elyon, the Most High God, the one who is exalted above his creation. He is the Adonai. He is our Lord or our Master, the one to whom we owe allegiance. He is El Olam, the everlasting God, the one who never changes. He is Elohim, the God, the Judge, the Creator of the universe. He is Tana, Tana. He is jealous. He is the one to whom we owe our affection that should not be split. He is the Lord Jehovah, Yahweh. And then we saw the Jehovah plus name. He is the Jehovah, the Lord of hosts. Jehovah Sabaoth, the Lord of armies, who is able to handle our situations. He is the Lord, our righteousness, who has made sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He is Jehovah Jireh, who sees all of our needs and supplies them in the person of Christ. He is the Lord, our banner, who is our resource for the fight that we fight in, and we need to tap into him in order to be victorious. He is the Lord, our shepherd, who cares for us like a shepherd cares for the sheep and leads us. He is the Lord who heals us spiritually. He takes away the sickness of sin and makes us right with God. He is the Lord who is there, who lives within us as his Holy Spirit indwells us. He is the Lord who sanctifies us who changes us from within and makes us different. And finally, he is the Lord, our peace. So you see when Jesus said to the Father, Father, keep them free, they were pretty secure. <laughs> uh, that's who God is. And that's not all of who God is. That's just a portion of who God has revealed himself to be. But we can take comfort from that and security as believers. That's what's holding us. We're not being held by a thread. We're not being held by, uh, you know, there's just a, a poly, uh, you know, one of those poly ropes are really slippy and you're sort of sliding on trying to fall with help by an unbreakable chain in the character of the name of God. So the, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. It's not something that we, we're not on the losing side, we're on the winning side and therefore the righteous run into it and are saved. So the challenge tonight is this, do you know God? Do you know him for yourself? Are you saved to start off with? If you're not, you should get sorted. If you are saved, do you have confidence in God? We should be very confident in our God because God is great. God is almighty. He is the El Shaddai, the almighty one. And that's the challenge for tonight. Let's stand and we'll pray. Father in heaven, Lord, I thank you for all that you are. I thank you for all these uh, names that you reveal yourself to be. And Lord, we're thankful that you, you meet and supply our every need in the person of Christ. And Lord, if there's anyone here tonight that has any special need, Lord, I pray that they would have that met through you, Lord. I pray that we wouldn't seek to um, have our needs met outside of you, but Lord, that each one would bring our cares and our problems to you, for you care for us. Help us, Lord, to put our cares and all these things upon you and to trust you because you love us and you've revealed yourself to be a benevolent God. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. All right, what song should we sing? I don't know. What about song number 32? Uh, actually, Psalm 33 is the one I was thinking. Psalm 33. And we'll just sing verse 1 of this about a mighty fortress is our God. And I think it fits in well with him being a strong power for us. So Psalm 33, just verse 1. <laughs>
Lord God, our heavenly, thank you for your name, uh, that you are a strong tower, Lord. We can flee to you, and Lord, um, for protection, thank you that you, uh, Lord, protect us from uh, these dangers and evils of the world, Lord, and thank you that you provide uh, our needs, and Lord, you take care of us, Lord, we watch over us. We thank you, Lord, that you are a mighty God, and we trust in a almighty God and we pray Lord that you would be with us this week and help us to flee to you Lord that we might have uh, secur security in you Lord uh, because you love us and you care for us help us to cast our case upon you Lord in Jesus name Amen, Amen. Amen. Amen.